Good, so um, today in this hour, we will finish the description of the process for designing ambient intelligence systems. And uh, at the end, uh, we will try to simplify this process that we will try to describe uh, into something that uh, could be feasible within uh, the activity of this course. Okay, so we'll uh, come down from the general description to what is required uh, in this course here. So um, last time we already discussed the first two steps, so problem statement and requirements, and uh, we can, con yeah, sorry, yeah, I jumped to the right point. Uh, and uh, um, we must continue from step three onward. Uh, step three is with the identification of requirements. So up to now, just uh, to recall, uh, we have some uh, general idea of what we want to build. And we already collected some inputs from the users of the system or the potential or future users of the system and from uh, stakeholders of the system itself. So we have some additional information. What we need to do at this point uh, is to gather all this information and uh, fix them, distill them into a set uh, of uh, features, set of requirements that the system that we are going to build uh, should respect, should, should satisfy. Okay, actually writing down the specification. And here, we make uh, all the strategic choices that we have from the functionality point of view, for the structure of the system point of view, what is in and what is out. The user said, or we collected the requirements or the information that the user would like to add this and this and that. We select which of these different desires will actually go into our system. So we make a decision, we, make, we shape the system in a sense by defining actually what is it? What are we going to build? Taking into account all the information that we have, but at the end we decide and we describe in a, and, we, and should be described in a very precise way uh, what kind of system we are going to build. We describe what the system does and what are, what is the context the environment in which the system can operate. So what are the assumptions about the external uh, world uh, surrounding the system. And uh, it's useful to think uh, the specification phase as a sort of a writing a contract. So when you're writing a contract, for example, for outsourcing some uh, development activity to an external company, you are specifying what this uh, external contractor should do and what kind of system it should deliver to you. And you, you understand that uh, every mistake that you make in writing a contract is something against you. So if something is too general, then the contractor is free to interpret it in this way, in a different way, uh, what you wrote, uh, and then come out with something different. And uh, if you write uh, something which is not clear, or not complete, or just wrong, different from what you actually intend, then the contractor will do something else. And you have no way to complain after the war. Because the contractor will just say, OK, have a look at the specification. This is what you have written. And so I'm, I'm OK. As long as I uh, implement the specification correctly, or a reasonable interpretation of the specification, if the specification is not precise enough and it's general, then the contractor is okay. And you, at the end, will have to pay the contractor and have a system which is not the system you want. So just, just try to enter into this mindset. Even if we are building the system ourselves, if, even if we are the contractors of ourselves, but just to understand how this document, this phase, would need to be precise, just pretend to be, you know, to separate the specification phase from the implementation phase. So at the end, we have this uh, requirements uh, the document, the document listing a set of requirements uh, uh, 
what is the requirement? The requirement is, the, as we say here, a description of the system services, so what the system does, and the constraints, so the limitations or the qualities by which the system is going to operate. Uh, for example, a system service or functionality is uh, uh, an action that the system will do. The system will control, I don't know, the temperature or the light. And the constraint is that the system should have access to some sensors, for example. Or the number of people should not be, be uh, above a given number. So there should be both constraints on the environment. The environment should provide this and this and that or they can be constrained on the system. The system cannot be more than this, more complex than this. You cannot ask uh, to be faster than 200 milliseconds, for example. So a lot of uh, information about how the system operates. In this phase, we don't have the system yet. We are designing, we are planning what we want to build. And uh, it's very difficult to write down or to specify correctly these uh, requirements. Uh, and I think it's a crucial step uh, in every software development process. In, I think it's the most crucial phase. Uh, uh, ag agreeing and defining precisely what we want to build. That is the reason why I put in this, into this presentation several more slides than the one I'm going to present or comment to you. Uh, because I think as, as a computer science uh, student, uh, uh, you would like, no, you should uh, try to understand better this. This is a topic which, which is usually uh, in, described in some way in the courses of software engineering and so on, but it's something that is not very technical or technological. It's not development, it's not programming. It's uh, how to manage the process of programming. And this is something that is really required uh, to manage, to master when you go out uh, and work at a company. So I put uh, into the slides some more material than we actually need in this course so that you can read when you have some more time and try to think about it and try to be ready for the next time you are going to develop some, something and sit down and spe speci first specify it or portion of it and then only the, after that implement. And these requirements are difficult to write. It's very difficult to describe something to another person in a way that they will understand uh, what we want. You are, you are going to work in groups, so you can try to do the exercise. One of you uh, tries to write, not to explain or to give examples, but to give precise requirements. The system should do this and that, and the other person would read it and try to come up with uh, maybe a different interpretation for what you have. You can have something read by the other person and see how easy it is uh, uh, to misunderstand or to misdescribe a requirement. For me, it happens every time. Every time I write an exam or every time we prepare an exercise for the labs, uh, we write some specification of what you have to do during the exam. We have something in mind of what we want you to ask, and there will always be somebody who, reading the same text, will understand something differently. So we are very aware of this difficulty. Okay? Uh, the requirements may be very general or may be very, very specific, very uh, detailed, depending on the size of the system and on the level at which we are describing them. Um, basically, we can group them into user-level requirements versus system-level requirements. So user-level um, requirements describe what the system, how, sorry, how the system behaves when it interacts with the user, when it serves the user request. It's something that everybody should be able to read. It should be readable and should be written for customers for end users. So the only way for a user to agree that you are going to build a system that they will like is that you describe the system and they really say, okay, this is what they want. 
So they should be able to read it. It should, be not, it should not be technical. But at the same time, it should not be ambiguous. So it should be precise enough, but described in a language that the users understand. We call them the language of the domain in which the system operates. So if we are building a system to control the lights, uh, talk about lights, don't talk about uh, watts or relays. Hmm? Um, on the other hand, for developing a system, you need a more detailed level of specification. So we call them system requirements that are specification for developers. And these system requirements or system level requirements are just a, a level of detail more than the user requirements. So if the user requirements just say how the system will react to a, to a given situation, well, the system requirements will describe all the different cases, all the different functionality, all the different thresholds of the different uh, situations in which the system will have to give this answer, give maybe the formulas, give maybe the time uh, by which it will respond, and so on. Something that you can give to a developer, and they will build the system. System requirements usually are not used uh, to, um, to communicate with the users or to the customer. Mm -hmm. uh, but it may be used uh, for, say, our sourcing or to give it to a, to a developer. Uh, just to have an example, a user level specification say the software must provide a way for representing accessing external files edited by other tools. We are talking about maybe a, a content editing platform, not, not an ambient intelligent system. So this is something that the user can understand, but the developer needs something more detailed. So, uh, okay, external files or what types? So we need to be able to define the types uh, uh, we need to be able to match the different tools that can open a file with the file types. So if it's a PDF file, it can be opened by these tools. If, if it's a JPEG file, it can be opened by other tools. All the, the, these details, uh, the file type is represented by an icon. All these details are essential if I'm specifying uh, how I want the system to be built, to behave, to look like but it's not essential for the user understanding that this functionality is there. Do they want this functionality? Yes. Do they like it? Yes. How it is implemented? Okay. We are, we have the details, but the user is no, is, no, is no longer involved. Many of these should not, in many cases, it cannot be understood by the users, but it can be understood by the developers and the technical people working on that. So we may have uh, different levels of requirements. And as we go further with the system, we should increase the level of detail, of course, uh, until at the end we'll get the code, huh? okay, the running code. Uh, and this, uh, there are, so there are different types of requirements, and these uh, go and can be read by different types of, uh, of users, of actors in the, in the development process. As I said, I will skip some quite quick, quickly some of these slides, but. Uh, so, at the different levels, there are different types of requirements. And uh, we can group them in three different areas of nature. Functional requirements, non-functional requirements, okay, uh, it's, uh, it's a Boolean uh, classification, or domain requirements. So the first two are the most important ones. Uh, functional requirements describe are the easiest ones. They describe what the system does. Are uh, operational. What are the actions of the system? What are the responses of the system when something happens? What are the actions that the system will do in given situations and so on? All of these we call functional requirements. The list of all the functions, functionalities, actions, procedures, call them as you want, depends on the system, that the system will do, is able to do. Okay? The different ways, the different actions. Okay? Um, I, they can be described very 
well, not very, quite easily by listing them. Okay, imagine, let's make a simple example, a website. You have uh, the, you can have the registration functionality. So you can, uh, for example, log in. You can have the register, registration for the new users. You can have the forgetting of the password. You can have uh, the deleting an account, changing the password. Each of these is a function, functionality. So in the area of user accounts, you may have four or five different functional requirements. And these functional requirements usually are written for the point of view of what the system can do for you. So I require that the system do something for me. For example, the system will provide the capability for a user to log in if the user already has an account. The system will provide the user the capability of creating a new account. The system will provide to a, to a logged user the possibility of changing the password. The system will provide, and so on, to a logged user the possibility to, to change their profile information. A list of items. And if we think about this, uh, each of these items is, in a way, independent from the others. You could build a system in which one of these is missing and add it li later. You can check them whether they are present independently from each other. Each function, okay, some functions depend on others. So you cannot talk about login without, if, we, if you don't have the registration because then people will not have a password to, to register. But apart from that, uh, the, the functionality of the system is easily incremented or can be incremented easily or at least we can think about it. Its functional requirements tend to be different uh, possibilities that the system can do and we can check them one by one. Uh, I highlighted this point because for in contrast to the non-functional requirements. Non-functional requirements uh, are general constraints on how the system will execute all of the functional requirements. I mean, one uh, non-functional requirements or quality requirement could be a constraint on the response time of the system. I would say the system will respond within 300 milliseconds. This is a quality requirement or non-functional requirement. There is not a single point in the system when you can check whether this requirement is met or not. If you say the user can change the password, you can check the code where this is done. You can easily say, okay, this requirement is satisfied by these 20 lines of code, by this web page, by this link that put together implement this functionality. If you say the system so it's, it's localized, a functional requirement in the system. Saying the response time should not be higher than 300 milliseconds, where, where can you check it? Everywhere. In every single line of code contributes to this requirement, whether it's met or not. You should test every possible functionality to check whether all of them respect this requirement. You cannot say, okay, I, I, I'm sure this is met because this part of code is implemented correctly. I tested and it works. Another non-functional requirement. The system can be used also on a smartphone and on a, website, on a web page. The, the user interface can be used also on a smartphone. Mm, it's, it's clear. Okay? It's clearly defined, but uh, you need to check every single page of the system, not just one of them, every single page, to check whether all of them work correctly and every single functionality in, in every single page to check whether this requirement is met or not. So in a way, non-functional requirements, we'll give more examples later, uh, are something that which are, which 
across all the system. The system as a whole uh, should be built with these requirements in mind. And every single functionality, every single line of code, every single in, uh, interface page should be built for satisfying a functional requirement while satisfying all the non-functional requirements that may have impact on that functionality. So these are the most difficult ones. Okay? It's easy to add one functionality later. It's very difficult to add one non-functional requirement later. Imagine if you build a website for normal browser, and then later you decide, oh, I want also the mobile version of that website. You have to redo everything from scratch, more or less. Adding one non-functional requirement later, or not taking into account some functional requirement at the beginning, will cause a big redoing or a big uh, cost in your system. So you cannot just uh, do them one by one. You must pull, pull all them up at the same time. And uh, more than that, you can also have some domain requirements, which are actually external requirements. The fact that the system is working in this place means that there are some rules that the system must follow. For example, if you measure the temperature, the temperature will be in some range, not lower, not higher. If uh, uh, we build a system, uh, you should, we should respect, for example, the security of the users. So you must not lock one person inside the room because if there is a danger, they should be able to exit without the intervention of the system. So there are some external constraints that we, know we don't decide, but we must apply because they are part of the environment or they're part of the legislation or the security rules and so on. We call them domain requirements because they, can, they come from the domain in which the system is going to operate. Okay, when we wa uh, write uh, requirements, functional and non-functional, uh, we should try to use these uh, attributes, adjectives. A good requirement uh, is something that should be, okay, first of all, correct. Okay, I should not write the wrong thing. It may seem uh, stupid, but uh, it means that uh, we have to check them. Unambiguous. Unambiguous means that uh, everybody that reads uh, this requirement uh, will understand the same thing. So it may be a correct thing, but uh, if it's ambiguous, then uh, it leads to different implementations. Complete, it, will, it must say everything that you need to know to implement the functionality. There should not be missing information. Okay? Consistent means that uh, you cannot have different requirements in your system that ask for contradi contradictory things or incompatible things. Okay? You cannot uh, have one requirement here that says one thing and one requirement three pages later that asks for something which is different. Hmm? If you say uh, every user will uh, log in with a username and password, and three pages later, you say, okay, but the system can use also Facebook authentication. Well, it's not consistent. Because then you have to choose whether you can use one or the other or both. But they can, you, just, you just can say you can use a username and password and then you can use Facebook authentication and not explain how they fit together. Because they, are, they describe a conflicting requirement. Hmm? Requirement especially... Uh, functional requirements uh, should be ranked. So you should be always able to say which are the most important requirements. I can write you a list of 200 requirements because when you start thinking about things, uh, a lot of details will come out. But then you will have to start from somewhere. And if you have to stop before you finish everything, what do you leave out? So we should always know which are the most important requirements. We start building the system from those. And if something is missing, it will be added later. 
So because the, we, we, need the, we, we never have the chance of building a complete system as a whole or every, every, everything at the beginning. We always should plan for an incremental development. So if I have a, some budget for building a small part of the system, which is the most important part that they should build? And then if this is successful, I can build the later ones. I already have them in mind. I already have the complete, the full set of requirements. But they are ranked, not in alphabetical order, in importance order. Huh? So we should, uh, it's part of the strategic planning. What is the selling point of our system? What is the most important part? Why, what are the parts uh, of the system that will drive our users in? And then once the users are interested, uh, are in the system, then we will add the functionalities to make it better and to make the users happier. But the driving force, the, the, the selling point, is already at the, there at the beginning. Hmm? Um, every requirement should be verifiable. I should be able always to say, given a system, and given a list of requirements, whether requirement number 38 is satisfied by the system or not. Because if I write a, system, a requirement which cannot be verified, think about the outsourcing or the contracting issue. The contractor, if the uh, requirement cannot be, there is not a clear procedure for verifying it, the contractor will, all be, uh, will always be right in doing nothing or in doing the wrong thing. If I have a requirement that says the user interface, uh, the user interface uh, should be nice to look or beautiful, this is not a requirement. It would be, would be a non-functional requirement, but it's not a requirement. What is the criteria for verifying whether the user interface is beautiful or not? It's a subjective issue. The, sy the system should be fast. The system should enable a search functionality. This is a functional requirement. It doesn't say anything. So if I implement a very stupid search that the user will never use because it's too stupid, well, that requirement is still met. But it can, you cannot actually verify whether they implemented what you asked for. Because even a search button that always returns the full list of documents would be one search functionality, a stupid, but uh, will match the requirement. So always try when you write a requirement how you will verify it. Huh? If it was a, a contract, usually there, if you do with, work with outsourcing, usually there is a sign-off phase, huh? a phase in which uh, the customer receives a system and then does a set of tests to check whether all the requirements are satisfied. And then signs a, a piece of paper saying, OK, this is the system, the system I want. But this can only be based on the basis of the written requirements that were agreed at the beginning. Hmm? So always, I think this uh, is uh, the most important uh, uh, property, hmm? being verifiable. Otherwise, it just, uh, that's why we need to be very precise in writing. Even in user level requirements, they should be read by the user, but the wording, the writing of the sentences should be precise enough to, to enable the verification later, because the user will change their mind immediately. And then we should be able to, we should be aware that the requirements will change. Requirements will change. I, we have a great idea today, and in a week we understand something new. We understand better what we thought, we start implementing, we discover something, and we want to change our system. So we should be able to do that. Of course, we need to be able to trace, and these, these two are linked, what, what is the impact of a change on one requirement into the system. Hmm? OK, uh, I will not, uh, we, here we have some more details about uh, each of these. But I, I will skip. Of course, the defects are the opposite. So just saying, try to write or to think about these requirements in a very precise way, like a checklist of points. 
Uh, more details about the uh, non-functional requirements. Uh, um, they define system properties and constraints, for example, reliability, response time, storage requirements, how much memory you need, uh, input-output capability, how many samples per second or megabytes per second, uh, and so on. User interfaces, uh, in some cases also the development uh, there may be development requirements. You should do, use this kind of programming language, this kind of, uh, of um, development environment, and so on. If, if you are thinking about this, we are doing in this phase, you are more or less thinking about the functionality of the systems, but we are in this course. We already started to give you some non-functional requirements, system requirements, uh, it should work on this machine, with, the la with this language, with these devices, and so on. So, some constraints that come from outside. Um, just some ideas of the kind of non-functional requirements that you find usually. Requirements about uh, the product or the system itself are the more or less easier to understand. Uh, about usability, so how the system will use the system, sorry, how the users will use the system, how easy or difficult it will be uh, if you need to train the users or if they have to understand it easily. So all the issues related to the ease of usage and the friendliness of the system. Efficiency. So how the system is efficient, efficient in terms of usage of resources. And resources usually are time and space. So a system can be, you can have efficiency requirements concerning time, response time, speed, or space, occupation of disk, occupation of memory, uh, of bandwidth, and so on. So you could have some requirements of this kind. If it has to run onto a um, Raspberry Pi, then you have some requirements uh, that, uh, that, are, that should be compatible with the performance and the memory available on the, on the board, for example, mm -hmm. and maybe better. Uh, reliability of the system. Reliability is the property of a system to deliver the service even when something goes wrong, when something breaks up when the network connection is down, when a component uh, is down, when the hard disk breaks, and so on. So describe what are the requirements of your system. Uh, if you're building a home uh, AMI system, what happens when, I don't know, the electricity goes out? So what does the system do? Do we have a backup battery so that the system can still operate, uh, maybe in a, in a limited way? Uh, uh, Full reliability is impossible. There is no system that possibly can deliver the same services even if parts of it break down. If some part breaks down, an unreliable system will just stop working. A reliable system will continue to work in a degraded way, in a limited way. So this heading reliability contains all of the requirements that we have with respect to what happens when something breaks up. Hmm? Portability, how it's easy to transfer the system to a different environment. To install, what are the constraints into the installation environment, uh, into the integration with other systems or subsystems, and so on. Hmm? Do we require something like this? You can imagine that each of these has an impact o o on all the system. So we should have this quite clear at the beginning if we forget one functional requirement, okay, you can discover it later. If you forget about one of these, it will have a, a much bigger impact on your, your development. Organizational requirements are, uh, in our cases, are lighter, but in a company that will be stronger. Uh, the requirements that come from the organization, so the company, in which you are working when you develop the system. So the company may have some standards on how to code, in what language, where to store the, the code, how to call the function, what kind of library to use, what kind of language to use, what toolkit, and so on. What kind of graphical interface, and how to implement, and so on. 
and I, where to store the code, how to compile, how to package it, and so on. So these are constraints that are coming from well, the context in which you are doing the development. For example, in our case, we will ask you, we are asking you to use some platform for discussion and uh, the Git platform for storing the source code and so on. These are kind of organization requirements that come, in this case, they are coming from outside. Plus external requirements that usually come from outside the company, from the external context, the law, ethical issue, safety, privacy. All of these issues have an impact on how the system does things. And we need to know that. And in the requirement analysis phase, we should write down which issues in this area have an impact on the system. Okay, maybe there is no security impact. Okay, we just don't write anything. But is there is something from the security point of view that impacts the system, for which the system should behave in a particular way, we write it down. Hmm? It's just a, the subset of, of items that are of, of impact or interest to the system. So this is a, big, a very big area. Hmm? Um, and uh, all of this is usually synthesized into one or one document or a set of documents. Of course, if you are building a Boeing aircraft, the functional the, the requirements should become 10 books uh, because you have to, to specify every single detail. Uh, if you are building a small CI website, maybe just three pages, hmm? if it's a simple one. But uh, this is uh, one possible structure of this requirement document. So the out, imagine the, uh, the outline of one document in which you write this. this uh, and uh, um, this part, the use case, is, is another name or is a way of representing uh, the functional requirement. The yeah, use case is one way in which the users will use the system. Actually, all the functional requirements can be expressed like that. We will not go into detail on how to describe use cases. That will take more, much more time. The, so the point three, I say, is the functional requirements. Points one of two, or point one is the general description of the system. Why are we building it? It's just a context. And the point two is very important because you have to define the, 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 um, the glossary of the terms that you are using in the rest of the document. So if you are talking about uh, a room in the rest of the system, because we are building a system for controlling, I don't know, the humidity in a room. So we need to define a room. Can, can it be anything? Any closed space or a closed space for, uh, or a living room can be also a corridor, a staircase? Is it in or out? Well, we, we decide, but we must be explicit. A room in the context of this document is such and such and such, maybe of these types. And we exclude, for example, open spaces or shared space and so on. Or we include them, we decide. The important uh, way, is, the important idea is that we want to define or redefine the words of the language to mean something very precise, because the language is ambiguous. In some cases, at this level and the, you, in the glossary phase, you also provide something like a, an entity relationship diagram to make explicit which are the concepts that you are relying on, that you want the system to work on, and what are the relationships. It's not an ER diagram for creating a database. The database will be much, much more complex and much more detailed. But for describing the abstract relationship within the general ideas, concepts, glossaries, names, you can use these terms in the, in the interchangeably. Hmm? And so the rest of the document will use those terms consistently. So either you talk about the user of a system or the inhabitant of the system, of the house, you define this word and then use all, all the word throughout the document in a consistent way. It will make this document more boring because you are repeating the same words over and over again because you have to try to define or to stick 
the nouns, especially nouns, substantives, uh, that, you that you defined at the beginning. It will be much more boring, but much more precise. Hmm? A technology to be used uh, uh, contains the operational requirements. Uh, the point five and six contain the other um, non-functional requirements. I took this uh, outline from one uh, uh, ISO standard from in software engineering that proposed this structure. So if you want to have more information about actually what you should write in these areas, uh, at the end of the presentation of this slide, there's the reference of the ISO standards. Uh, you have just 40 pages that describe it into more detail. But just to, to say that uh, every organization then, they develop a sort of a template in which they develop uh, the requirements document uh, so that it's a document. And this document will be traced in some way, different version, different changes will be approved, uh, and then will be the reference uh, for, for, the whole, uh, for the whole design. Many parts of this, for example, the technology to be used in many cases can be reused from one design to another because a company tends to do systems that are based on the same kind of technologies. So having a, a, a structure which is defined helps reusing and helps understanding, helps finding, finding stuff when you look for it. Okay, I will skip the details here. So at the end of this phase, that we just outlined very briefly, um, what we have is the requirements document. Okay? A document that may be 10 pages or 200 pages, it depends on the complexity of the system and the, on the level of detail at which you go. At this point, we start, let's say we completed the specification phase and we are starting the implementation phase. We have some specifications and we start building a system that will match at the end these specifications. They will satisfy all these requirements. The first step in our case, and this, uh, here the process becomes more specific to DMI, uh, the first step will be to think about the architecture. Architecture is uh, which are the pieces that you need, the parts that you need, and how they fit together. We start from a system architecture, so the overall system, how does it look like? Uh, sort of a box diagram. I have this component, uh, this software, these devices, these sensors, and, uh, and this uh, user interface, and they are connected in this way. And from the system architecture, we detail better what is the hardware architecture, so what are the hardware components, the software architecture, the software modules that you have to write and how they communicate, and then, of course, the network architecture, which is some way implied by the others in some way. So, what are the questions that we should ask? So in the system architecture, I would ask myself, what are the main system components? What is their nature? Hardware, software, a device, an algorithm. Uh, what kind of information they exchange? Each of these blocks will exist for exchanging information with, with the environment, acting and sensing, with the user interfaces, with the other components to exchange data. So uh, hardware will exchange data with the software that will elaborate it and we show it to the user, or we use it to change some other environment variable and so on. So what, what are the main uh, logical components, some of which uh, will be mapped to software, some of which will be mapped to hardware, but we are interested on, on what are the main logical components and how, what kind of information they exchange. We are still a very, at a very high level. We are starting to draw a, a picture huh, for thinking about the system. And at this level, we start thinking, okay, but computational nodes, how many CPUs or intelligent nodes do we need? Just one? All the computation is uh, on the Raspberry Pi, for example? or some computation is on the PI and some is on the smart device, smartphone, or some it should be 
uh, offloading into a cloud uh, computing services because it's a very heavy computing. So how many computing nodes do we have? What are the types of sensors, actuators that we have? Uh, what kind of uh, physical quantities we need to measure from the environment? And what, uh, what kind of physical quantity do we need to influence on the environment? We are still at the architecture level. We are not talking about the specific sensor yet. But what kind of uh, information should flow from and to the environment into the system or out of the system? And then, of course, we will need sensors and actuator to do that. And we'll select them that later. But now we understand what we want to, uh, what kind of information we need to process. Where do we need to put them? Uh, uh, how to connect them with, uh, with uh, which other components? Where do we put these interfaces? Are they mobile? Are they fixed? Are they small? Are they big? Very, let's say, high-level questions so that we can frame a big picture of the system. And if there is some software and they have more than one computational node, which part of the software runs on which node? Uh, so the data analysis runs on this CPU or on that CPU, if I have the choice. Which is the best allocation of resources or computational resources to the software modules? This is something that we define at the system architecture. And the system architecture, in more detail, has some ar hardware architecture. So what are the hardware objects, the physical objects that I need to buy or build? They can be the computational nodes, can be devices for interacting with environments, sensor and, and actuators, and user interface devices. So this is a part, a view on the system architecture. One way to see the system architecture is to make a projection into the hardware domain. And so having the list of types of devices that we need. Types of devices, not yet actual sp uh, specific devices, because there may be choices to do. But we, need, we know that we have need, a need of a, of a sensor of a given type that will measure this type of quantities. And we'll, we position that uh, location and that will be used for this kind of functionality. And so on. Another way of projecting the system architecture is on the software side. What are the main, I'm saying the main or the major because I don't have all the details yet, the main software modules that will need the, that the system will need to, to, to work, to deliver the functionality. If you say that the system should be able to, I don't know, process the location of the user, you need a, a software module that will take information from the sensor and then determine the position of the user with some given precision. That will be a software functionality and you should allocate it somewhere. I need it. I need it. Then I will find whether I, can, I should write it or I find it somewhere else. I can buy it or can download it. I can, but I, need, I know that this functionality is required. Hmm? So we are making the list of the big blocks that the system will need in order to implement the functionalities of the requirement. And we, show, we should always uh, try to track this process. Say, OK, this software block is here or this hardware component is there because of requirement number 38. Not just because I like it, but because there is a reason to put it there, because some requirements actually needs that. If we can track it, then it will be easier to also scale or incrementally build the architecture of the system as we incrementally build the set of system features that we are supporting. Um, so we have a big picture with uh, a lot of boxes where we write the functionality that we want. And we write the information that can be exchanged. And all of this, we are convinced that we will match the requirement. At this point, uh, we should go into actually selecting the components, hardware and software, mainly hardware. Software tends to be developed. Uh, the hardware needs to be built. <clears throat> so in this phase, we need to identify the actual products, the name, the number, 
of, uh, of uh, the, the code, the serial number of product, uh, to populate the given our architecture. So we, I said, OK, we, I need a light sensor there, or a present sensor here. OK, at the, in this stage, in the, in the previous stage, I identified the requirement for a given hardware that will deliver a given functionality. At this point, I will seek which kind of components can be available on the market, for example, that can deliver this kind of functionality. Take into account the cost. Oh, this is a very nice sensor. Oh, but it costs too much. So uh, we, can, we do not consider it. Uh, the easy of integration. Is it easy to put that, that specific component into our system, or is it, it, does have a, it doesn't have a nice interface to work with? It's very complex, and so we, we need to evaluate all the trade-offs. Because in the previous phase, we thought about uh, conceptual components, functions, and here we talk about specific components that you have in the market. And in some cases, you will not find a component that you want, and so you go into a do-it-yourself solution. You must build something, not just buy something. And what you will discover is that some choices that you made during the architecture definition phase need to be modified, need to be rethought. Uh, because uh, actually you, you imagine you could use a sensor in some way, but then you discover that the sensor is not available or it costs too much. And so you need to change your plans. You, you, you need to uh, deliver the same or to match the same requirements with a different architectural solution. And this is normal. You need to iterate, go back and modify and redo. Is there a question? Uh, during the, um, uh, well, the design phase or the phase or when we're uh, writing the requirements, yeah. shouldn't we take into account, um, well, shouldn't we do research for uh, so that we don't end up in, in a case where we like, want to use a certain functionality that isn't available, for example? Or is it possible? So the, the question was uh, uh, um, when we are doing the requirement analysis, uh, uh, whether we should need uh, already at that stage to do some market research uh, in order to avoid uh, specifying a system that cannot be built, uh, that we will later discover that cannot be built, right? Is that? Um, yes, you should always uh, know what you are doing, I would say. So when you're specifying a system, you should already have an idea of where you are, uh, you are going to. Uh, you should have an idea of feasibility. You know that it's feasible, it can be done. Or if there is something which you are not sure, okay, you should investigate that. So that you are sure that you are specifying something that can be done in some way, and may, maybe you also have some idea of how, you can do, of how you can do that. But then when you're writing the requirements, you try to forget about that specific solution you saw. Because otherwise you are constraining yourself too early to a specific solution. So maybe it's the only one in the world, so you will go back to there. Or it's the best efficient one in the world, you will go back to that specific solution. But you should be open also to explore different solutions. It would be difficult or imp impossible to specify a system, to write the requirement for a system when, when you don't know the technology at all. You cannot per, then, uh, take, pick one person that doesn't know about the technology and say, write a system specification. Uh, only just maybe from the user point of view, because they will not understand the limitation of what is feasible today. So it's important to have a knowledge of what kind of uh, functionalities can be delivered, uh, maybe more or less at what cost and which not. But just to avoid what's impossible, and, uh, and then forget about that when you're writing the specific requirement. Hmm? in general terms. OK, uh, I'm saying, uh, but in, at any stage, even if you are doing some scouting at the beginning, some search at the beginning, you will find out that something is not as you like it. And you will need to iterate. So the, the process is very linear that I'm trying to describe, but always keep in mind that at every step, you will need, you will find out that you need to reconsider something that you already thought you decided earlier. It's normal. Hmm? Um, hardware components, uh, we understand that it can be of two different categories, no? of the shelf uh, components available in the market, 
and custom components that you build yourself with the electronics, actually. Hmm? Uh, so first of all, I will start from of the shell components. If something is available on the market, probably is already more tested and uh, maybe also more economical than building the same thing myself. And for sure, it's quicker. It's quicker to have a component uh, out of the market than to build one myself. Then, okay, maybe if I am planning to build uh, 1,000 copies or 10,000 copies of my system, it may turn out to be more economical to create my own components or to, or to design my own components because then I can build them exactly in the way I want. But in uh, small numbers, on small scales, uh, usually it's more economical to go on the market than to build something uh, yourself. If their functionality is available at the cost that can be acceptable to, acceptable to you. Otherwise, you need to build it yourself. If it's not available or if it's too, too expensive. Um, when you're selecting components uh, of the shell, try to be compact and try to use uh, or select groups of components that share the same protocol. Uh, we saw that the number of protocols in the uh, smart home domain is uh, very huge, uh, and so it would be very uh, costly or will require more effort to support four different types of sensors, one Modbus, one Connex, one... Uh, uh, Z-Wave and the other Zigbee, for example. And you need to, to, to create a system which is much more complex because you just select the... So you need to select the, the devices on the basis of the functionality and also on the basis of the integration technology, the protocols that, 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 that they speak. So if you try to minimize the number of overall protocols you need to handle in your system. And of course, you need also to include in this selection of over-the-shelf components, uh, computational nodes. You are, you are never going to build a microprocessor yourself. Computational nodes are always are on the market, uh, but how, power, how powerful do you need them to be? What CPU do you need? What, how much uh, memory do you need? And then you select one platform uh, for each computational node. Uh, in the custom phase, uh, in the custom case, you must, you have a specification for one component, you must build it, you must first of all understand the electronics, the sensors, the interfaces, the input-output, which is the, actually the reason you are building a custom component. You are not building a custom component for doing software development. For doing some hardware interfacing with the environment, basically, or with some mechanical device, for example. So the main constraint, the main driving reason why you are building a custom component is to interface with something which cannot be interfaced directly with other uh, components. And then, uh, of course, this node should have uh, some small computational support, just in order to be able, maybe something as simple as a serial port, but you need to get that out or in to the system. So it would be an electronics, an analogical part probably, and a digital part also. There are platforms for doing that, for example, but uh, like the Arduino or something very low cost in which you have already a minimal logical part uh, and, uh, and uh, a very open way of integrating different analogic input output or digital input output. And so I try to give a general picture of this phase in which the system architecture for selecting the components. We analyze the system architecture and for all the different nodes, especially in the hardware part, we try to decide whether this node can be off the shelf or do it yourself. Off the shelf, we just have to select the components and the user self components. For each of them, we must uh, design the electronics and the input outputs and uh, the board, the CPU, and firmware on which these uh, input outputs will be integrated. What do we have at the end? We have, uh, simply speaking, a bill of materials, a list of components that we need to build a system. A list for which you can go and buy the components or the parts of these components that you need to integrate and design and solder and, uh, and so on. So we call it a bill of materials, the list of all the materials that will actually 
build the system. When you have this, you can start the actual implementation. So up to now, we didn't write a line of code, and we didn't use any real device, maybe for testing, for qualifying, for checking if they are good enough, yes, but not in the system. At this part, uh, we, we start a real uh, work uh, in the hardware part and in the software part to build all the nodes or the components uh, that we have in our architecture. The do-it-yourself hardware needs to be implemented, the off-the-shelf hardware doesn't need to be implemented or designed, but needs just to be installed and configured maybe, you need to specify configuration. Software needs to be developed and integrated with other libraries or modules or platforms that you have. And all these activities should, can go usually in parallel. So there is some person that you know, works on the hardware, some person that works on the uh, integration of all the shell components, some other person or group that works on the software, some other that work on the interface and so on. So I mark this activity with a double bar here because it's a, we call them a complex activity. And uh, I try to uh, analyze it or to represent it in this diagram. Say, okay, the design implementation starts from all of the knowledge and specification that we developed so far. So we need to know the requirement, the functional and non-functional one, the, the components that we have selected, the general architecture that tells us how the system, how the pieces will fit together. And we start the development itself. Software on this side, hardware on the right side. On the left side, we have software. I just wrote a box, software development, and I also marked this as a complex box because actually it's a process, software development. It's not just something that uh, you do from the morning to the evening and then it's finished. It's a process. And the software, just remember, probably there will be software managing each of these four uh, parts of the main ambient intelligence loop. You remember this picture? You cannot read it here, but you remember that we had a picture with four uh, phases, sensing, acting, uh, reasoning, and interacting, the four main functions. And each of these four needs to be present and needs some software to manage it. So there will be com software components for each of these. Hmm? And for hardware, Again, we can have off-the-shelf hardware or do-it-yourself hardware. With off-the-shelf, it's easier because you just need to install and configure something, and connect it, uh, and give uh, the power to the network. And with do-it-yourself, uh, it's a complex process because you need actually to do all the hardware development process. So these two boxes, software development and uh, design, build, test, and integrate do-it-yourself ha hardware, hide most of the complexity, hide most of the time in your project. It's where the actual work goes, hmm? the actual implementation work. And uh, all of these components may also be in the sensing, in the acting, on the interacting phases. Will be used for interacting, for example, all the user interface components. Uh, many of them will be off the shelf. You, you think about a screen, but you think about uh, some LAD composition, maybe, then it would be a do-it-yourself uh, user interface uh, um, components, so it's, uh, and sensing and acting, of course. Uh, what is missing here is the reasoning. We don't do reasoning in hardware, usually. We have computational nodes for doing that. So here we have four different sub-functions of software, and here we have only three sub-functions of hardware. Hmm? And at the end, we will have the hardware and software of our system. And then testing, which you test the bug, validation, check, modification, and so on. Usually testing and the bug takes as much time as uh, development. If you take one month to develop it, you will take at least one month to make it work right, to correct the bugs, uh, to find uh, and uh, uh, so let's, let's plan for that. It's not something that you do the evening before. And testing the system means, first of all, deploying it. So you need to plug everything together, connect everything together, 
and give power. We hope nothing smokes hmm? and nothing explodes and things start talking to each other and doing something. And uh, we need to verify the system at two different levels, at the level of the requirements and at the level of the users. Okay, at the level of the requirements is more a technical work. Just checking that the requirements are implemented correctly, the functional ones, the non-functional ones. So you can do it yourself. In many cases, in many work groups, uh, there is a specific testing group or test engineering group that is different from the development group because it's very difficult for a developer to test their own part. So in your group, try to switch roles. If you develop one part, then try to test another one and have the, your colleague that developed a different part to test yours. Then you will find bugs much quicker. And then we also need to satisfy what the users want. Because in the ultimate analysis, this is why the system is being built. And we, we, I'll give you uh, some more detail about this in a second, just to say that uh, testing as development uh, should be done in small incremental development steps. You should implement some part of the system, a minimally working part, and test that part in the first week. Then implement something more and test something more, and so on. Never wait too much before testing. Never. Huh? Otherwise, you will find uh, which is be, that will be, it will be impossible to test and to finish the system. Always have a system since the first week of implementation that works. There's something very small, but it works. And then add functionalities, add devices, add interfaces one by one, and still continue to test. In some company, there is a rule that uh, at every evening, during the night, the system is built and is checked you know, automatically with a set of in software only systems. It's called the continuous integration testing. So you are responsible before you go home of not committing any code that will break the build and will break the test overnight. Otherwise, in the morning, you will find a lot of, very, a lot of angry people looking at you. Uh, we will not have a, such a, a strong, uh, hard discipline here, but uh, just remember that the test is uh, very difficult and it's easier if you do it in small steps. About the testing, what are we testing? Usually, you find two different words that are called verification and validation. The definition is that verification checks that the product system meets a set of design specifications. So it, we are checking whether the system is consistent with the respect to the requirements document, to the list of functional and non-functional requirements. Uh, the word is, uh, I am building the system right, in the right way, on the other hand, validation checks whether the product or sorry, system meets the needs of the user. So the system does something that respects the user needs, the stakeholder requirements, and so on. So we are going up one step, huh? one step uh, before in the process. And actually, the question we are trying to ask, which is more difficult, is uh, I, not I'm building the system right, but I'm building the right system, the system that does the right thing, that does what the users want, because there may be a system that is perfect but doesn't do what we want. Huh? Remember the swing picture at the beginning of this presentation. It works, but it's different from, from what we want. So we, will, we should always have these two questions in mind. First is the correctness of the system, is working correctly, it implements the functionality correctly, but then, again, we test with users and check whether the users ask for something, and we can also involve users in this kind of testing. Once of the, all the major bugs and security issues are being sorted out, we can involve the user for the validation of the product. And every step, remember, uh, needs to iterate. You need to check, and we always be open to reconsider a previous choice, always. Huh? 
You cannot change everything from the beginning every day, because then you will never converge. But if you have one reason to say, okay, we made this choice, maybe it's creating too many difficulties, always try to think, go back, reconsider, and change. Hmm? Uh, there are some modern development methodologies that are agile methodologies and so on that just incorrect for that. Just go one step at a time, one functionality at a time, then every day try to reconsider, find the next one to work on, and so on. And the suggestion is always uh, do small steps. Loop over small improvements, small steps, and always have a working system that you will increment one function at a time. Hmm? Um, so what looks like a, a waterfall development process, no, they, they, they called it in the software engineering, waterfall process is something that goes from, from high to low and never goes back. A waterfall never goes back. No? Uh, we are more like this Asher picture where the waterfall falls down and then goes back. Always the, uh, going down, but then goes back and, and repeats. And we repeat the loop every time we need. All the loop or small parts of the loop. Um, okay. So we try to be quite general and try to understand the main issues, the main phases of development of this kind of MEA systems where we are, we are driven by some user requirements and some features that can be supported by the devices. In this course, of course, we don't have all the, um, all the time and all the resources to follow a structured process. And uh, um, this is not the last version. This is not the last version, sorry. Uh, real, rule number one, always have a backup plan. This is the last version. OK. Um, so in this course, uh, we don't have all the time and resources, we said. And so we try to propose a simplified process, something that can we, do, we can do in 60 hours. Uh, um, Basically, we don't have uh, the time uh, for developing the methodology and then for actually involving user groups, uh, both in the initial uh, requirement analysis and the final uh, user validation phase, system validation phase. But try to do that informally. Try to speak with users. We will not put into, uh, in, we do not require an, say, an, official, an, an officially um, explicit user testing process. Uh, we need to concentrate more on development and testing, uh, and so we will have less uh, because we need. To have some, we want to have something working, and so we try to take shortcuts in the specification and requirements phase. It's important, but it will take some time by its own. We'll try to shrink it a bit, not to have you waste too much time before developing. And the component selection is somewhat constrained by the available devices. What we have in the lab, what you may have yourself, what we may borrow from a friend or something like that. So we cannot have a very open and wide selection, component selection. So in some way, we are try also to drive the ideas towards something which can be realized with the components that we have. So it will, will be a mixed process. It's not just user-driven, but it's mainly also component constraint in some way, yeah, if you want to call it like this way. So I try to come down from the general process to four explicit steps hmm, that we are going to ask in your uh, course. There are five boxes, but two of them have the same number, so they are the same, they are connected. Okay? One, two, three, and four. By grouping functionality and skipping and taking some shortcuts over the general process. Actually, what uh, we are going to ask you is to follow these four steps. The first step is the current one, where we are now. Okay? Uh, define a goal 
present a vision of how the system will work, providing a system description, and try to include, even informally, some user inputs. Not just discuss it among ourselves, but also try to uh, make it read by other people. We are using the plus, the collaborative platform, to, to help us uh, uh, pull ideas and uh, discuss them, and then we will try to narrow then the choices to some set of, uh, of uh, system that we'll build during the course. At the end, it will be asked to uh, write a deliverable, which is a, a system summary description, what the system will do. One, two pages, written in user language, hmm? user understandable language. The second phase, uh, I, I grouped the analysis phase and the system design and the architecture design. So trying to put together some functional requirements, some non-functional requirements, and uh, the system architecture, the general architecture of the system level. So the next step, once uh, we define the, the system summary, start working on the specification. And uh, write this document that tries to be quite synthetic, but contain the essential information about this. Especially from the functional requirements, try to stick at the most important ones, the one that characterizes your system. Of course, you can always add something later, but the description should uh, start with four, five, six, ten functions which are really working well, hmm? rather than many functions where some are not very well implemented, some are buggy or so. Also. Then there will be the big phase of design implementation. And so, naturally, you will have a list of, com of components that you need, a bill of materials, hardware and, and uh, computational nodes and sensors and so on, and the source code or the software code that you are going to develop, you are developing. And so we, we ask you to use the repository for continuously sharing and updating the software, trying to use that. And uh, finally, testing uh, will include verification and validation, verification mainly yours and validation, you can also exchange your work and let, let it test by some other users. And the deliverable for this phase of testing actually is the, is the exam, in which at the exam you will present the system and we will try to verify and validate it, so whether it's right and it works correctly and it does the right thing at the exam time. Hmm? Uh, we will give you later details of uh, uh, when to deliver a given step, uh, when, so what are the deadlines, uh, we know that the deadline for for step one, start from Monday 30, the 23rd, and then will be closed a few days later. And, uh, uh, but at that time, you will have uh, already to, to discuss and to present the ideas, and then you have some time to formalize them. And all the deliverables for the, all the different phases must be submitted through the platform. No emails, please. No uh, USB keys or no other ways of exchanging information. Everything on the platform. We are a development team, and we use the collaboration tools, the modern collaboration tools, not emails. We'll provide a template, or at least the essential, the essential information that you need to include in each of these four phases of deliverables. Deliverable will be checked, but not evaluated. I mean that uh, we will check that you are um, sending them in time, that they are not just empty files, so they not contain a scan and copy of the uh, Mickey Mouse comics, uh, but we'll not uh, score them and we are not going to give a feedback on them. Okay, it's a process that you go on for having feedback, talk to us uh, in the labs and so on. It's not, uh, it's not, will not be, will not give a formalized feedback on the deliverable. We will just follow that, uh, but for any questions, uh, ask and uh, don't wait for us to look at your deliverable and so on. Hmm? Uh, all, but all these deliverables, so they will not be evaluated when you submit them. They will be evaluated at the exam. So this time we will see the, the whole picture and everything uh, will, just, will count, uh, say, for the final evaluation. Okay, on this process, we will give you more details because now, right now we are more concerned in the overall process than in the specific uh, uh, dates uh, and, uh, and templates and so on. Hmm? But this should be what, what, you are, what you need to plan to do uh, uh, from here to the, to the half of June when we we'll, we'll have the, the exam date. Okay. 
for today, I'm I finished and I'm okay. So we make a small break and then go to the next uh, class. Thank you.